Good morning by your church, by your family, and welcome. Whether you're here this morning with us in person or online, I invite you to sing his praise. Our Lord and Savior, his name is Jesus. Let's praise him right now. our King, come let us bow at His feet, He has done great things, see what our Savior has done, see how His love overcomes, He has done great things, He has done great things. we give thanks that we have been set free from the power and the penalty of sin and that we have new life in Christ Jesus this morning. We praise you and we thank you for all the great things that you have done and will do. Let's sing this out. Upon a hill, a perfect Savior, upon that day, the greatest love. The punishment that should have fallen on us Upon him, upon him Upon his head, a crown of thorns Upon his heart, a broken world The wage of sin 
All the weight of our transgressions were upon him, upon him. So we say, Christ has died. We are, we are forgiven in Christ alive. So we are the risen and he shall come again. Pray. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me shaking, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus.
I wonder who this morning especially needs to hear that truth, the truth that God will not fail. He will not fail us as a people, as the church of Jesus Christ. He will not fail us as individuals struggling with deeply personal problems. That's a truth you can claim for all eternity when you are a follower of Christ. Let's pray together. And we thank you, Father that you will not forsake us, you will not leave us. Father, we may rest in you this hour that we are together and throughout the days that you have written out for us. May we discover that anew today in ways perhaps that we never have before. And we pray these things in your son's name, amen. You may have a seat. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Bayou Church. My name is Carol Mills. We're so delighted that you've joined us today. A very special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. And for those of you who are joining us perhaps for the very first time, we want you to feel welcome. We want you to feel comfortable and at home. And whenever you're ready, we would love to connect with you. We have a couple of easy ways for you to do that. You can connect with us online 24-7 by going to the bayouchurch.org slash connect. Whether you have a prayer request, you'd just like some information, or would like to hear from someone on our staff, you can take care of that there. And of course, if you're here in the auditorium in the seat back in front of you, there's a connection card. We invite you to fill that out if you like, and you can drop it in one of the drop boxes on your way out today guests we'd love to say hello to you in person so you can take this card to our guest center which is to your left in the foyer we've got some friendly faces there that would just like to say good morning help you take whatever your next step might be and we do have a small gift for our first time guests well as many of you know here at the bayou church we are passionate about making a difference in acadiana adding value to our community by providing hands-on help and financial support, especially to ministries that serve those who are under-resourced and at risk. 
Well, Pastor Daniel Kelly is one of those difference makers in Lafayette. He pastors a church called Harvest Center Church, and this is a faith community that God is raising up in a part of Lafayette that most people look at and say, high crime, high poverty, low expectation that anything will ever change there. But God has given Pastor DK a vision, and he's given him a plan, and now he's given him a piece of property. And what Pastor DK is building is a learning center for that neighborhood, for kids and families to discover who they are in Christ, to reimagine their future and potentially transform that community. And guess what? Your generosity makes it possible for us to be a part of that dream that is unfolding on the north side of Lafayette. In the fall, Pastor DK came to us. He shared the vision, and we were able to make a significant donation to get started renovating a building that had been donated to him. And now as we step into the summer, it's time to work on the interior. So our incredible Bayou crew and 31 singles in our church descended on his location a few Saturdays ago, one of the largest projects we've done, and they did demo work throughout the interior, preparing it for final steps. Pastor DK was, of course, very grateful, but what he didn't expect was what we did just before he left. And again, because of your generosity, we were able to give check number two, which should ensure that this project can be completed so that kids can become a part of this learning center this very fall. Well, he wanted to thank you personally, so Pastor DK shot this video and sent it to us. Take a look at it now. All right, everybody, Pastor DK here, pastor of the Harvest Center Church. I am right now standing in the learning center where this Saturday you guys came out and helped us demo, knock down, demolition, whatever you want to call it. We did it Saturday. Thank you, Bayou Crew, for showing up and showing out, man. Uh, you guys are helping us to reach the end of phase one and getting ready for the physical school year in August. Let me tell you, check number two, your generosity is changing the game pushing God's vision for this community. You guys are doing decades there. We're doing generations here all together for his glory. Shout out to Pastor Sean, Carol Mills, Nathan, uh, Greg Palmer, Kirk, Jason, everybody who showed up and helped on Saturday. Hey, you bar appreciate it, man. We're doing great things for God's kingdom, God's glory together for his purpose. And by the way, July 24th, I'm coming to the bayou. I got a word for you. Y'all be blessed. Pastor DK. How awesome is that? If you'd like to be a part of jumping into projects like this and so many more that our church is doing, you can go to thebayouchurch.org slash give. Well, now we turn our attention to the baptistry where a very special young man is making a profession of faith and following through with baptism. Let's enjoy that together now. This is a moment when people get to put an outward display to an inward commitment of what God has done in their life. So they're here today to let you know that they no longer live for themselves, but they now live for Jesus Christ. Good morning, Bayou Church. We are so excited to be here today to continue in worship as we celebrate a baptism. Um, this is Paul, and Paul, let me tell you, is a sharp dude. Um, he asks some great questions, um, some really deep questions for um, a nine-year-old. And so we are just so excited to be here with his family. You see your family right here? They're here to support you, encourage you, and celebrate you. So I have a question for you. Is it true that you have placed your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? 
Yes, ma'am, it is on that profession that I get to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you so much for today. I just thank you for Paul and his decision to follow you. Lord, I just pray for him as he continues to grow his relationship with you, Lord, that he trusts you and follows you with everything that he has. We love you so much and we're so thankful for today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, amen. Let's give Paul one more round of some love. So pumped for him and his crew, for his dad, his mom, his grandparents. I know we got some other uh, family and crew with him here today. Baptism is a beautiful picture, as you see in the New Testament, of a life that has been transformed, one that was dead but now is alive, not by our works, but by what Jesus did on the cross and us putting our faith in him. So cool to see every single week. We've got another baptism at the 11 o'clock service, and it's so awesome to see just about every single week someone displaying, putting an outward symbol uh, to an inward transformation because of Jesus. Congratulations, Paul. So I, uh, I'm pumped to get to be with you today. We've got some fun things that we're going to do together um, as a church this morning. And one of those things is, as you will see in the seat back in front of you, go ahead and grab this card. I want to tell you why this card is so important. And if you're online, you can access this digitally. Actually, in the room, I would prefer you to do it digitally. But just so you can see what it is, you can scan this with your phone uh, very quickly. If you just open up your camera and put it on this QR code, it'll, it'll send you a link. It'll give you a link you can click on. And I want to tell you a story. So uh, one time there was a, a leader in our church, uh, a gentleman in our church who was uh, an awesome guy who so many loved, and he uh, lost a loved one, went through a very difficult situation, a tragic loss, and we, we tried to call him and we couldn't get in touch with him. Wasn't answering his phone, didn't, didn't respond, and we were like, we're just going to go to his house because we want to be there to pray with him, encourage him, serve him. And we go to his house, and no one's there. And we're like, what is going on? Like, did, is, is he gone too? Like, what is the deal? And so finally we find out. It took a long time, but finally we found out. He had moved, and we just never knew. We never knew. And so having your accurate up-to-date information is so valuable, not only so we can communicate well with you, because there's so many different things that are happening around the bayou, but also in those moments of care, those moments of need, so we can actually reach you, so we can actually, if we're able to, uh, show up at your house uh, to serve you. Um, and so this card is for you. It's really a tool for you to help us, to, to help you. Um, as you know, I say this often, uh, we will treat your information the same way we will want our information to be treated. Um, you're not going to, this doesn't, in fact, you'll see to sign up for our newsletter, you have to opt in. This doesn't automatically opt you in. And I will never share your information with another organization. I've had people ask me like, hey, Sean, can I get a hold of that Bayou Church email list? To which I say, no, you can't. Don't ask again, right? Because it's my job to protect your information. And so this truly is our desire to serve you and to pastor you well. So if you would take a second and start filling that out right now, um, I would love for you to do that. Again, if you're a guest, this is for you. The connection card, whenever you're ready, it doesn't have to be this Sunday, but whenever you're ready, guest, this is, a, this is for you. If you are a part of the Bayou Church or you're not a guest, which is everyone else, even online, I'd love for everyone to fill out the form. It'll be one per family. Again, do it digitally if you can, but if you prefer to do it um, you know, handwritten right now, you can do that. But this way, uh, we will have your up-to-date and accurate uh, information. And you'll also see at the bottom of the form, digitally as well, there's a prayer request. I'd love to know how we can pray for you. We, we genuinely believe that we're called to pray first, not last. Um, it's not our last resort, it's our first play. And so we would love to pray. So I'm literally gonna be quiet for two minutes. And I'm gonna give you a second to right now fill out that form. And so our team's going to play a little music. So if you would do that right now, go for it. Thank you. And it's one per family, too. Just, I don't know if I said that. It's one form per family to fill out. Just one per family. So...
feel like I'm giving a pop quiz or something, huh? <laughs> Sorry if I'm bringing back negative emotions. those up feel free to take more time if you need I'm gonna start preaching in just a second uh, if you did the physical copy you can fold it and drop it in a drop box as you exit and again if you did the digital obviously that will uh, you can submit that right now thank you for doing that it's a huge deal I know it might seem like what is going on it may seem weird but trust me it's so crucial um, in those moments uh, to uh, communicate one more thing before we jump into the message uh, for those of you who got to hear our student ministry coordinator uh, Hayden Fob, did he not do an awesome job last Sunday? My goodness, that was so awesome to see um, and to think that he, along with Pastor Griff and Harley and our entire Next Gen team, that's who is leading our high school and middle school students. We've got a phenomenal Next Gen team. Let me pray for us. I'm going to jump into uh, God's Word. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for Paul's baptism. Uh, thank you for the baptism at the next service. Thank you for Pastor DK. Thank you for all that you're doing in and through this church, God. Uh, we love being about uh, your mission and your work. And right now, God, uh, we're here not to hear from me, uh, but from you, God, to hear from the supernatural power of your word, God. Uh, we know that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from your mouth, Lord. So we ask you to speak in powerful ways, God. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. So today I'm kicking off a brand new series called List, which is kind of like a series of sermons. It'll be a, about a three or four part series. And it's called List, and the subtitle is Putting First Things First. And this is a unique, I kind of, in my sermon prep, I was like, really, Lord, is this where you want me to take this? And it became so clear um, that this is going to be applicable in so many ways. And this, this sermon series is unique uh, for a couple reasons. One, because it's personal. Like, I'm going to share with you some things today that, that I've experienced as a person, as a follower of Christ, um, as a leader, as an organizational leader, as a pastor, um, and some things that are really super practical. I'm going to get really, really practical in today's uh, message. And I'm going to get so practical, it might even not feel like a sermon. It might even feel like a little coaching session, but I want you to understand the implications and the scripture that you'll see shortly, the implications absolutely are spiritual, absolutely apply to every area of our lives. Because, and here's what kind of generated the desire to preach this message and this series of messages, because I've been hearing from you. I've been hearing from a lot of different people in our church, numerous. Like I can go down a, a long list of people who have expressed this emotion to me. Sean, I'm overwhelmed. I'm stretched. I'm pulled too thin. I'm pulled in multiple directions. I've got five things vying for my attention, and I don't even have time for two of them, much less all five of them. And this is pretty common in our culture, isn't it, right? We, we live in an information-dense society. How many of you, like me, you sometimes spend more time scrolling through what's on Netflix than actually watching what's on Netflix? Anybody else? It's like, okay, we got to set a timer because it's been 20 minutes and we haven't decided yet what we're going to watch. Anybody ever been to this restaurant called the Cheesecake Factory? Anybody ever been there? And they hand you this binder and I'm like, I don't know what to do. I, I can't make any decision. There's two, just tell me. Just go tell them to cook something and bring it to me, right? Like, there's way, there's two, it's information overload. And while that's humorous, in reality, this plays out in some serious ways in our jobs. When I've sat down at my desk and gone, I don't even know where to begin. Sometimes it happens in our homes, right? Like our, our to-do list at home piles up. This is when it happens often, is with kids and activities, right? Like, okay, you're going to take this kid and then teleport them over here magically because they got to be there, but this isn't out yet. And I've only got two vehicles. Can I, can I Uber a four-year-old? Is that appropriate? Like, is that legal? Can I, can I do that? Like that? I know that many of you parents feel that way with your schedules, with your parenting, with your money, 
right? Like you've got these bills and these things you want to do and you're looking at your budget, you're going, this uh, mathematically doesn't make sense, that we're overwhelmed with the different choices that we have in our lives and what it feels like is an avalanche. Now, I've never been in an avalanche, but I can just imagine what it must feel like to be skiing or snowboarding in an area where the ground literally starts to shake at 360 degrees. And what happens to, if you've ever seen any videos or documentaries, is, is it totally envelops and overwhelms. And, and if there's one place that I don't ever want to be is at the bottom of an avalanche, buried beneath where if anyone knows you're in there, and if they send a rescue crew, and if they have a dog, the dog is literally trying to smell if you are there. That's not a situation that, and then what do they do? They start shoveling. I don't know anybody shoveling above my head, right? Like it just seems like a terrifying moment. But many of you, myself many times in my life, have been caught in an avalanche an avalanche of work, an avalanche of stuff to do at home, an avalanche of parenting, an avalanche of finances. How do we get out of that avalanche? Because there's more at stake than just the avalanche itself. Because when you live like that, you're going to be stressed. And as you may or may not know, stress literally has physical consequences. It's not just a mental consequence. It physically pulls and wears on your body. And if you don't manage it and deal with it correctly, it can cause even death. Like you can create disease in your body because you're not dealing with stress. It creates anxiety. It creates a lack of peace with health consequences. It also makes us vulnerable to make poor decisions and sometimes do very stupid things. It also has a spiritual impact on us as well, doesn't it? It pulls on our soul, it can draw us away from what's most important, which is our relationship with God. And it can have an impact even on our soul. And I love what Pastor John Ortberg says about our souls. The neglected soul doesn't go away, it goes awry. Like it goes, it goes amiss, it goes wrong, it malfunctions, it doesn't go away. It creates problems. The neglected soul, if you neglect our soul, it doesn't go into time out. It expresses itself in painful, dysfunctional ways. How is your soul? Because many people that I talk to, their soul is what's crying out. Their soul is crying out for peace and health and what's good and what's right. So how do we, in the avalanches of life, survive? I found something that I thought was so fascinating. It almost like, is this real? If I hadn't seen video evidence, I would almost think this thing isn't real. So there is a thing that skiers and snowboarders who are skiing and snowboarding in avalanche potential areas that they wear now. It's really brand new. It's called an avalanche airbag. You ever heard of this before? I didn't hear this until recently. Check out this picture. Here's, here's what an avalanche airbag is. They wear a backpack, and it has a pull string. And if you're skiing and there's an avalanche that breaks out, you pull on that drawstring, and in the middle picture, you see this kind of bladder begin to inflate on your back. And then the third picture, is it fully inflated? And then this next picture, go to the next picture for me, Andrew, illustrates what happens. If you're skiing, an avalanche breaks out, and you don't have this inflation device, you go down, and the, the snow goes up, and you're buried beneath, which has got to be absolutely terrifying. But this avalanche airbag picks you up and lets the snow go. Now, it's not guaranteed to save your life, but it dramatically increases the chance. And I can't play the YouTube video for copyright reasons, but you can go and see these things at work on YouTube where people are snowboarding, sometimes with a GoPro, sometimes it's a camera away watching, and the avalanche breaks out, and you see them start to go down. They pull the string, and this thing keeps them at the top of the snow. And then it's obviously this color because, check this guy out. Typically, he would be buried, and they would be going, we don't know where he is. We saw him up there, but now that it's at the bottom of the mountain, we don't know where he is. But not only because of the color of the airbag, but because the airbag stays on top, because it's lighter than the snow, it keeps the human, it keeps the person alive. And wasn't that fascinating? You got to go check out the videos. It is scary, but also this is such a brilliant Brilliant. The, the latest video I watched is a guy, someone gave him this as a birthday present, and the next week he was in an avalanche and it saved his life. I mean, it's just fascinating to see this. 
So God has given us in Scripture a kind of avalanche airbag. You know what it is? It's a list. It's a list. God has given us a list. When we use list, they operate as an avalanche airbag. Now, I know you don't understand yet, but let me explain to you. So I'll give you one story. So my dad is the senior pastor, and um, I'm serving. I'm new in my role as his number two. So his job is to preach and to cast vision and to lead the entire organization. My role at the time, kind of what Carol Mills' role is today, is everything else, which is a huge job. Like, you're in charge of executing that vision. And so I'm early in that role, and I'm totally overwhelmed. I'm looking at all that has to be done, I'm looking at where God has spoken vision through our pastor, where we're heading, and I'm looking at what, how we're gonna build a team, how we're gonna execute this vision, I'm just totally overwhelmed. Brand new to this role. And we at the time had this brilliant coach, his name was Todd McMitchin, who worked with my dad and I and our staff and, and really helped us grow and learn and, and achieve some really big things. And I remember one particular meeting where Todd was in town and, and we're meeting in the conference room and the first words out of my mouth are pessimistic. Todd, we've just got too much to do. We're, we're not going to accomplish anything today. Today is not going to be a good day. We've got way too much to do and not enough time to do it. You know what Todd did? He smiled at me. And I was like, why are you smiling? This is not funny. This is serious. How, look at all this important stuff we got to do. He said, he said, Sean, calm down. <laughs> like, take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. Let me show you how to handle this. And then he walked me through a process that I'm going to teach you today that's actually found in multiple places through Scripture that operates as your avalanche airbag. That as the avalanche of life comes at you, this keeps you at the surface doing what is most important. And here is what Todd taught me to do. He said, Sean, take everything you got to do and then, like, summarize it. And this is really the first step is to summarize, like, put little bullet points of everything that's on your to-do list. And then he said, Sean, now take the things that are most important and put them at the top. Look at all that, that you've got to do and identify what is most important and, and grade them. This, okay, this wants to be done today, but it doesn't have to be done today. Or this might seem important, but if this doesn't happen, it's not that big a deal. This is the most important thing. And again, this can apply to your career. This can apply to your home life. This can apply to your marriage, to your relationships. This can apply financially as well. And he said, John, put what's most important and we're going to do those things today. I'm going to work with you and we're going to accomplish what's most important and do this first. See, most people, many times in my life, I don't do what's most important first. I do what feeds my flesh. I do what feels good. I check social media. I check the news, right? I check my email. Those aren't what's most important. And we get inundated with things that most aren't most important. And then at the end of the day, we're like, oh, well, now I need to start doing the really important things. This applies to school, doesn't it? I know school just let out, but this is so applicable to school as well. Do what is most important first. Do what's most important first. And just a little, if I could add a sub note under here, if you're, and this applies at work and at home as well, if what you have to do absolutely like has to be done and you don't have enough time to do it, but it absolutely has to be done. You know what that means? You need a team. You need a team. If you're trying to start a new business, and there's too much to be done, and it can't be done. It can't be, you know, put off to later. You need a team. It's what makes great organizations great. It's what makes the Bayou so impactful. <laughs> because it ain't all me. <laughs> Most of it's not me. It's my incredible team of Carol and Bernard and Dina and Becky and Ed and Lydia and Linton and Griff. And I, I mean, we've got an incredible team that does so many different things. And this can apply in your home as well. If you've got too much to do at home, you need to talk with your spouse and, and talk about who's gonna cover what. You need to take the device out of your kid's hands and recruit them, wink, wink, hint, hint, and say, hey, guess what? You're gonna sweep the floor. You're gonna mow the grass. 
you're going to do, you need to, you need to recruit a team and delegate to them. You need to do what's most important first. Don't wait till the end of the day to do what's most important. Don't wait till the end of the day. No, do what's most important first. And then the fourth step, which is really, really important. This is what Todd told me. You're going to have to trust God with the rest. You're going to have to trust God with the rest. You're going to have to go, okay, God, I've done everything that I can, but you have made me with parameters and limits. I'm gonna have to trust you with what I can't do. My to-do list since day one of being a senior pastor, which is about two and a half years ago, has never been completed. It's only grown. That's an avalanche. And so I keep what's most important at the top, what's most important at the top, what's most important at the top. And the rest can wait or it can be delegated, but what's most important has to stay at the top. And this applies to small things, in your day, I do this every single day. What's most important for me to do today? I prioritize it, I do it first, and then I trust God. I go home, I, go, I tell work, you're done. I'm going home to do my most important job, which is to love my wife and to love and to lead my kids. Life can often feel like an avalanche, but God has given us these lists to act as Avalanche airbags, summarize, prioritize, do what's most important first, and then trust God with the rest. You don't have to be afraid when you have too much to do. You don't have to be. You don't have to worry about having too much to do. Now, there are two assumptions that are required if we're gonna execute this well, if we're gonna live this out, and they're both have huge spiritual implications. And the first one is this. If I'm gonna do this, I've gotta know and accept my limited abilities. I've gotta know and accept my limited abilities. I often ask God for more hours in the day. Do you know what he says? Nope, I've said it, it's 24, get over it, move on. God, I, I wanna, I wanna neglect my health so I can work harder. I wanna skip meals and I wanna not sleep as much. That is not sustainable. Some people think, well, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna drink a bunch of Red Bulls. I got multiple friends, they just drink Red Bull and I'm going, you're going to die if you do that, right? That is not how God made, so you need to accept how God made your body to work, that you need rest, that you need a Sabbath that you need time alone with God every day. Your soul needs to be fed. You have limitations. You need to accept them and stop operating like you're the one person who doesn't need sufficient sleep. You are not. And the principles, you, you, you can't break principles. Principles end up breaking you. So you need to accept your limited abilities, that you can't run the company by yourself, that you can't work 80 hours a week and have a healthy marriage and have kids who you have a healthy relationship with. Accept your limited abilities. Accept your limited abilities, which leads to the second one, which is hard for us to do, which is to know and trust God's unlimited ability to know that ultimately he's in control, that ultimately he can make ends meet, that he can multiply time, that he can multiply impact, that he can figure it out for you. We've got to trust and to know God's unlimited abilities. We've got to summarize, prioritize, do what's most important first, and trust God with the rest. And when we do this, you know what it does? It centers us. It, it gives us a healthy body, a healthy mind, healthy emotions, healthier relationships, a healthier marriage, healthier relationship with your kids, with your friends. It'll help you more long-term have a sustainable career. It'll help you spiritually as well to not drift and go, well, I can do this without God. I can do this without being in God's word every day. I can do this on my own. I can do this without prayer. Oh, you think you can? God will say, okay, show me. And that's when we get off center and we begin to, things begin to crack and things begin to show that they were never 
healthy. And the other result of doing this is you live on target. You live on purpose. You achieve what God has purposed you because the world would love to distract you. If the devil can't cause you to sin, he'll just make you busy. Either way, you'll miss your purpose. But when we do this, that's when we live out our greatest purpose that God has given us, which is now what we'll turn to is, this is seen in uh, multiple locations of scripture, but the best one I read uh, this week in my study was in Exodus chapter 18 with Moses and his father-in-law Jethro. We're gonna read a good story about a father-in-law speaking some truth, and he needed to speak it, and Moses needed to hear it. So a little context, Moses, grew up in Pharaoh's court, right, while his people were enslaved. And then God calls Moses to liberate his people. So Moses went from leading sheep to leading a ton of people. Like he's thrust into this leadership role. And by God's power, he frees his people from enslavement in Egypt. They leave, they cross the Red Sea. God has that whole splitting sea moment where he destroys Pharaoh's army. And now they're on their journey. Now they're on their journey, and Moses thinks that he's going to be everything to everybody, that I'm going to fix everybody's problems, that I got enough. And Moses, in his first step, missteps. And here is where we pick it up in Exodus chapter 18. The next day, Moses took his seat to hear all the people's disputes against each other. And check out what happened. And the people waited before him from morning until evening, saying they waited all day long with no help, no provision. Now, this isn't a Chick-fil-A line that's really, really long but goes really fast. Praise the Lord, right? This is a long that, the line that is long and does not move very fast at all. And so here's what happens. When Moses' father-in-law saw All that Moses was doing for the people, he came into town to visit, and he sees what Moses is doing, and he's kind of like turning his head going, son, what are you doing? And here's what he says. He says, what are you really trying to accomplish here? Like, don't you see what's so obvious in front of you? Why are you trying to do all of this alone while everyone else stands around you from morning until evening? Moses replied. Check out the theme here. Because the people come to me to get a ruling from God. When, I, when a, dispute arise, a dispute arises, they come to me, and I am the one who settles the case between the quarreling parties. I inform the people of God's decrees and give them his instructions. Do you see the theme there? Me, I'm the solution. I don't know if that's because of pride or ignorance. Sometimes it's a little bit of both. But we've done that before. We think we are going to be the one that does the entire to-do list for everyone else. We're, we're going to be the white knight that saves everybody, and, and everybody comes to us. Some of that's ignorance and foolishness. Some of it's pride, because we like that people need us and want us. But Jethro is telling Moses, son, you, what? here's what he says. He says, this is not good. <laughs> okay, that's a polite way of saying you're dumb. <laughs> this ain't smart. You're a fool. This is not sustainable. Check out what he says next. You're going to wear yourself out. You're going to burn out, which many people do. I've been in that situation before. You're going to burn out, and you're going to do nothing well. Because you try to do everything well, you're going to end up doing nothing well. And not only are you going to burn out, but you're going to burn out the people too. These people need you to lead They don't need you to do everything for them. They need you to lead and provide in other ways. And so this is how Jethro uh, continues. This job is too heavy, a burden for you to handle all by yourself. Some of you are trying to do too much. You need to learn how to say no. You need to learn how to say no to some work things. Not everything, I get it. You gotta work, you gotta provide. But you don't have to say yes to everything. You need to say no to some Invitations. As Pastor Griff says, no is a full sentence. It's a full sentence, no. Now you don't have to say it like that, but you, you have the responsibility to say no to some things. You have the responsibility to say no to some things so you can say yes to the best things. So you can say yes to God, so you can say yes to your family, 
so you can say yes to your health. The bill's coming due. It's coming due. Say no now so you can say yes to the better and best things. Here's what Jethro says. Now listen to me and let me give you a word of advice. And may God, this is like the sit down, come to Jesus meeting that Jethro, that we need sometimes from our in-laws. Now listen to me and let me give you a word of advice. And may God be with you. So here's, here's where you're going to see the summarize, prioritize, and do what's most important first. You should continue to be the people. He doesn't say go on vacation. He says there are some things, Moses, that you do need and have to do. You should continue to be the people's representative before God, bringing their disputes to him. Teach them God's decrees and give them his instructions. Show them how to conduct their lives. Moses, that is your job. No one else can do that. And you see this in other parts of Scripture where Jesus delegated. And Jesus said, this is your job. In the, in the book of Acts, chapter 6, you see where the disciples were getting pulled from the teaching of God's word and from praying. And they had to delegate and they had to prioritize what was most important. And here's the team building part. I mean, this is in Scripture. This is so cool. But select from all the people some, check out this description, some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. Ooh, that's good. When you hire, when you recruit, you look for character first because you can teach competency. In most situations, you can teach competency, but it's hard, it's not impossible to teach character. So find some people who exhibit great character, who fear God, who are honest men, who hate bribes. They don't just not do themselves. They don't tolerate being around bribes. And then do this. Appoint them. Empower them. Position them. Authorize them as leaders over groups of 1,000, over 100, over 1,510. Based on their capacity and their ability, give them responsibility. Assign them, this is your chunk. This is your zone. I want you to live here and I want you to provide for these people. They should always be available to solve the people's common disputes. They should always be available to solve the people's common disputes. But have them, check this out, bring the major cases to you. See, Moses, you need to handle the things that only you can handle. You need to try to handle everything for everybody. Handle the ones that need to come to you. And then check out what he says next. Let the leaders decide for themselves the smaller matters. They will help you carry the load, making the task easier for you. You're going to win. You're going to do better. If you follow this advice and if God commands you to do so, then you will be able to endure the pressures. You'll survive. Not only survive, you'll thrive. And these people will go home in peace. You see that? You'll thrive. If you will summarize, prioritize, do what's most important first, delegate if you need to, and then trust God with the rest, you'll thrive. You won't be overwhelmed. Your soul will be at peace. Your relationships will be healthy. And the people who are depending on you will be healthy too. See, my to-do list tells me I need to be here till 10 o'clock every night. And I could justifiably do it for good reason. I mean, I'm a pastor. Like, people need, but you know what? I need to say no. And I need to say, hey man, I would love to be there, but unfortunately I can't. And I need to go home. And I need to, because my kids need me. My wife needs me. God gave me a role in addition to pastoring. And honestly, if I could just define the relationship between you and I, my first ministry is my home, is my wife, and then my kids. And then with everything else that God's given me, I'm pouring my life into serving you. Now that's sustainable, that's healthy, and I haven't always done it that way. And many pastors love their church and serve their family instead of loving their family and serving their church. You know what ends up happening to them? They lose both because they haven't taken care of their soul and they do something foolish or immoral and they, because they were trying to be like Moses and they weren't listening to God through Jethro going, no, 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 no. What's most important? Is it really, 
Important that I stay, you know, a couple hours late. Now look, there are times when we need to stay late and work hard. But it's when they're the rule that they're unhealthy. When they're in the exception, it's fine. My wife doesn't mind. She, she gets it. It's a demanding role. You have a demanding role. But what's the rule? What's the normal thing? And what's the exception? Because if you're always staying late and your kids are pulling on you for dad, mom, can I, can I have a little time? Now, when they're young, they don't know how to say that. They sometimes act out. So maybe their misbehavior, I don't know, maybe their misbehavior is them crying out for help, going, I just need some time with the people that matter most to me. See, you'll thrive when you live in a healthy way, and those who depend on you will thrive as well. But you've got to Know and accept your limited abilities. You can't do it all. You can't. And you also have to know and trust God's unlimited abilities. There's many times where I've sat down and go, God, I don't know how this is all going to get done. But you're God. I'm not. I'm going to summarize, prioritize, do what's most important first, and then trust you with the rest. And I have literally gotten home down to the second at the time that I needed to be home, and everything was done that day. That's happened. I've literally sat in my car in the driveway and taken pictures of my clock on my dashboard and gone, Lord, wow. Because he is God. It doesn't stress him out at all. He's big enough to handle all that he has given you to do. And as I said, this is just one example. Jesus did this. He called his disciples to do it. And there's so many lists throughout Scripture that help us stay above the avalanche. And so my question for you this morning is, are you doing too much? Are you in the middle of an avalanche? Are cracks starting to appear in your health, in your relationships, in your marriage, in your soul? One friend uh, I talked to, and they were telling me how busy they were, and they were in a situation at work. And because he was not spending time in God's Word, because he was not sleeping enough, eating enough, he was trying to ride the Red Bulls, he ended up in a position where he could have compromised his marriage with an inappropriate relationship. But uh, someone put him in an inappropriate position. And by God's power, he had the spiritual clarity to go, oh, no. And he said, you need to go, I'm, I'm out. This, isn't, this is not okay. And he shut it down. Thank God he shut it down. Because, think about what's at stake. See, you think you working extra hard more than you should is not a big deal. There's nothing at stake. There is so much at stake. Your soul, your relationships, your spiritual walk with Jesus is at stake. That's why this is so important. And Moses did what Jethro told him to do. And he went on to do some really, really big, important things like receive the Ten Commandments and give them to humanity, right? Imagine if Moses was too busy judging everybody and didn't receive the Ten Commandments. Now, I know that's kind of a crazy question, but it applies to you and I. What if you get so swamped in the minutia of life that doesn't even really matter? No one's going to know if you check social media or not. No one's going to know if you, if you cleaned out your inbox, but your kids will know if you're not home very much. What if, because of the minutia of life, you miss your purpose in life? Because God has one for you. He puts you on this planet for a purpose and with a purpose. And if you let the avalanche of life consume you, you'll never get it. Again, the enemy doesn't have to make you sin. He just has to make you busy. You'll miss it either way. Are you doing too much? Do you need to hit reset? That's what I love about this season of the year. It's, it's kind of like a natural transition to go, okay, what needs to be on my schedule and what doesn't need to be on my schedule? And we'll talk about the implications of this and some other list in Scripture in the coming weeks. But you tell me, what's, what's the Spirit telling you in this moment? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for caring about the, the details of our life, God. Uh, would you help us, Lord, um, to put you first, to trust you and to see with clarity what you tell us is most important in life. God, because the world's pulling on us. So many ads, so much media out there. Lord, it's always pulling us. Lord, would you help us to resist those gravitational pulls 
and instead to focus on you and to do what's most important first. And then leave work, go home, do our jobs at home, love our families, love our friends, show up for small group, and to put what's most important first and then trust you with the rest, God. Because you are, you're, you're an unlimited God. All-knowing, all-powerful. You, you're not short on resources. You're not short on time. You're not short on wisdom. So God, we need it. We depend on it. Thank you for how much you love us, God. Thank you for calling us to your purposes for our life. Lord, thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. I love you, church. Hey, don't forget to turn these in and finish filling these out. We'll see y'all next week for part two. Have a great week.